Hi, everybody. How's the sound? Can you hear me right? Okay. Um, I was just telling Perry here how good of a public speaker Eli is, so he's a very hard act to follow. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm excited to, to share a little bit I know about the startup. Um, Lean Principles for Nonprofits. How many of you here have heard of Lean Startup before? And you all know what that is? No! <laughs> <laughs> How many of you looked it up before you come here? Okay, thank you. Um, this is me, my name is Kayvon. Everybody calls me K, or Big K, or a Special K. <laughs> Whatever works for you, my job is to respond. There is my Twitter handle and Facebook, my email if you want to email me, and also the link if you want to book an appointment with me. I will be more than happy to help any one of you. It only costs a coffee and a banana loaf. Yeah, I'm not cheap. Um, yeah, I organize um, Lean Startup Vancouver Meetup. I'm not doing a very good job. I like to do better. Um, also, recently started another meetup called Entrepreneurial Growth because uh, I noticed that there are lots of resources out there for working on your business, working on your organization, how to get so many people on your Facebook, how to grow your business. But all of that great advice and all of these Lean startup methodologies, I know that if they are not implemented, we're not going anywhere. Who's going to implement that? People. Who's the most important person? The entrepreneur. <coughs> and the entrepreneurship skills, uh, mindsets, way of thinking, and all of that, there isn't much resources out there. So the entrepreneurial growth is about working on the person and uh, basically training ourselves to be the best entrepreneurs that we can be. You can also find that on Meetup. We're going to have our very first meeting in a few weeks, a week or two. It's called Entrepreneurial Growth, and uh, that's about that. Um, my background, um, back in the year 1998 or so, I started working with technology. I wanted to make my um, living working with computers and internet, so obviously the best choice, first choice was to teach myself uh, web design. I did that, then I noticed um, there's this thing called HTML, that whatever I do here, something happens over there. So I looked into that, and I noticed that there are websites that they do something. Oh, it's called JavaScript, so let's look into that. I learned that too. And uh, I was hired as a web designer and an internet programmer after a while. I had uh, part-time projects, then I had more part-time projects, so all of that became my full-time gig. Then I had more part-time projects, I had to get help, and one day I found myself signing paychecks. So, damn, I have a business now. So that's why I like to think of myself as the chosen one. <laughs> then I, uh, I quickly noticed I don't know anything about business or entrepreneurship. Somebody has to do that for the business. So. Um, for the past five years or so, I have been interested in everything about entrepreneurship, creating organizations and growing them. I read about 50 business books a year, and uh, all of that helps me help my clients uh, to go in different places. We have lots of uh, interesting conversations, and as Eli mentioned, um, a little bit of our entrepreneurial coaching came out of that because I noticed this pattern among my friends and my customers that they're developing this habit of, let's go have a coffee with Kayvon. So I thought, hey, I can get paid for this. So <laughs> I started a coaching business. And uh, that's my background. Let's talk about Lean Startups. Lean Startup was put together by Eric Ries and uh, putting together best of these three um, print, uh, methodologies that are out there, Lean Manufacturing um, by Toyota in Japan, Agile Development, uh, specifically software development, 
and customer development, which is a concept developed by Steve Blank, um, explained in his book, um, Four Steps to Epiphany, which um, the rewrite of that yeah, has the name uh, Startups Owner's Manual. The core idea behind Lean is to minimize waste. Obviously, there are more than one way to do anything. If there is a way to do something, there is a better way to do something. And so how can we minimize waste? Minimize waste of time, money, people, resources, ideas, energy, all of that to get to our answers, to get our, to our results, in a most efficient way. Also, it is very important to build something that people actually want. And I have to tell you that I'm going to frame everything in the format of a business. I'm a lean startup guy. I don't know much about nonprofits, so I'm not going to claim that I'm a nonprofit kind of guy. So I'm going to frame everything in the format of business knowing that everything here, Lean Principles, applies to everything and, uh, that we can do, either in nonprofits, or uh, for the creation of the whole business, or just a product, or a service department, or a new service, or even a personal life. The principles are the same, so it's, it's about creating something new in whatever environment. And in finding out what works, Obviously, the most important element of it is customer feedback. If we go to our own cave and start creating something based on the assumption that this is a good idea, people want this, people, you know, yeah, I can sell this. Um, that's a very different mindset from actually asking people, would this work for you? Is this something you want? Do you have this problem? So that's the main idea behind this core idea. Read that. <laughs> it's so true. So be careful of that trap. Basically, the, I'm going to tell you a um, huge secret in success in everything. Whatever ideas you have, whatever answers you think you know, and I don't care what source is coming from, from your study, from your background, from your upbringing, from the books you have read, you're wrong. Do the opposite. And you will be successful. Give it a try. Whatever you think is right, don't do that. Do the opposite. I'm going to give you an obvious example. Marketing, which has been my latest passion. People go to business schools or business books. It's all about how to do something. You go learn about accounting. This is how it's done. This is how you do it. Management, this is how it's done. This is how you do it. But when it comes to marketing, you go learn everything so you don't do it again. Marketing is about doing something different. And in creating something new, in finding the best ways to do something, in minimizing waste, you want to find new ways of doing things. And it's always about going against the current, trying something new, and see if it works or not. And obviously, if you have a plan so that this is how I'm going to test this, you're minimizing the danger and you're minimizing the waste. What is a startup? A human institution designed to deliver a new product or service under conditions of extreme uncertainty. I guess that extreme uncertainty part applies to everybody here. If non-profit is not extreme uncertainty, I don't know what that is. Yep, that's exactly the same thing that I just said. So, the idea of Lean Startup is go through iterations of a cycle. It's called the build, measure, learn cycle. As many times as possible to get our validated learning going so we can learn about what we are doing, what works, what doesn't work, 
the quicker we can go through this cycle, more validated learning that we're doing, we're going to be data informed, data driven, make best decisions in quickest times, and build what's gonna work for us. And at any time, if you have questions, just raise your hand. I don't mind the interruption at all. What's the point? Was it why lean startup is import important? It's the un unfair advantage that an organization with lean startup gets over any other organization that they don't have that. Simply because they're doing the same thing, getting the same results with least with uh, less amount of waste. Let alone, usually they end up with better results. We are very good at achieving failure. Most organizations, most startups fail. That's the reality. Definition of failure. Successfully executing a bad plan. If you're building some, something that nobody wants, why do we even do that? So the opposite of that is what we want. This is how achieving failure is done. We project something in the future. We think it's going to go that way. We're going to have our best guesses together. It's usually called the business plan. That is basically a bunch of uh, best guesses. And then we go do it. We go execute and compare the results that we got with the projection that we had. And uh, we consider it either success or failure. That's for product development, it used to be called, uh, or it is still called the waterfall method, and lean manufacturing companies are not doing that anymore. It is also very important for us to know who our customer is, know everything about them, and uh, develop something that's called a persona or an avatar, and we will get to that soon. As I said at the beginning, the Lean Startup principles and methodology can be applied to everything, to just a project, or entrepreneurship, or a new feature of existing product, or the whole product development. So um, the same methodology can apply to building the whole organization or just a little piece of it. And that's the main goal of a startup, to find out what works. That's actually the difference between a business and a startup. The main goal of business is to make money. Doesn't matter what size, that's the main number one goal. But the number one goal of a startup is not that. It's to find out what works. And when they have, they have the answer, switching from this to that will make a startup a business now. For my own business, I was in startup mode for two years. As of January 1st, I switched to business mode. And now everything is scared. In finding out what works, we have to ans have answers or find answers to some important questions. What, are, what problem are we solving and for whom? How are we solving this problem? Is it a product? Is it a service? Is it consulting? How is it done? Is our solution needed, even wanted? Can it be done that way? Can it be done better, faster? And how? what's the minimum actions or requirements that we can spend to get the same results? And when we put all of that into a structure, it's called the Lean Startup Cycle. Build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, go through that. We build a product, or a feature of a product, or a whole business, doesn't matter what. We build, we send it to the market, we measure their feedback, we get some data from the market, from the users, we learn from that, we get new ideas, we make a change, we build it again, we send it to the market again, and on and on and on and on. That's the core idea behind validated learning to find out what works and why it works and uh, follow basically that path. And the quickest 
quicker that we can go through the cycle, the quicker the cycle of innovation, coming up with new ideas and making the right changes, which if they are just small changes, they're just changes or corrections. If they are big, they're called a pivot. Basically means we were going that way, now we're going this way. We were going to serve small businesses, one to five people companies, not anymore. We have to serve 50 people companies because this is not the right solution for them. Or what we can do is wrong for these people, right for those people. Those are an exam examples of what we call a pivot. And the more often we pivot, the less, least, less waste we have. And that gives us a, an ability to adapt quickly to situations. And many times uh, we are faced with changes that happen because of the environment. And economy changes or, I don't know, industry changes or law changes. I know there was a startup that they were um, expanding in Vancouver called Uber. They're not here anymore because uh, the city transportation law considers them a limousine service, so minimal charge has to be $75 or more, so they can't operate here anymore. So they're gone. We have them in other cities, not in Vancouver. A startup is an experiment to find out what works. And the best way to do experiments is the scientific way, the way scientifics are doing it. We love Einstein because he had an idea. He said, I'm going to go test it. And we got the brilliance out there. So let's repeat the same sort of success for ourselves. So in building in a startup, what does it take to go from an idea to implementation? This is waterfall development, what I mentioned earlier before. This is the way it used to be done. First, we talk to our clients and get some requirements from them. Imagine, I don't know, a software development project. We, do, we get some learning, we learn a bit from our clients about our clients in that phase. Then we go from this to that. There is no interaction with the client over here. Programmers are coding, builders are building, whatever is happening, designers are designing. We do that, we test it to make sure what we are building it works. And as you can see, very little learning from the market happens. Then we release it to the client. And usually they're gonna say, this is not what we wanted. Or, yeah, we said we wanted that, but we don't want it anymore. So most of our learning very painfully happens here. And uh, that doesn't make sense anymore. That's the old way to go about it. Or same approach when it comes to writing a plan. First, we write a plan, a business plan, which is basically about how we're going to operate and what our financial model is going to be. And that's based on the assumption that we know everything there is to know about future and how it's going to happen. Obviously, not right. And uh, it's based on the assumption we have this plan, it covers everything, all we have to do is execute it. And the reality is no plan ever survives the first contact with clients. And that's the good news. Because that's where growth happens. Personally, for the entrepreneur, and also for the business. The reason is what I told you before. Startups are not a smaller version of a larger corporation. Smart startups are not a smaller version of a business. Startups search. Companies execute. Search for what? So, for what works? You want to find out the answers. Execute what? A plan based on the knowledge that we know what works and how we're going to charge people and make money from there. So, there are two different animals, and this distinction is uh, getting more popular out there, not popular enough. But in that process of searching for an answer, we need, still need a plan, sort of like a search plan, a plan that comes before the business plan. That scientific approach that we talked about, how do we go about that? What's our plan to find an answer? 
our search plan. So from the search plan, then we can get to the operating business plan. These are the phases. We have the search phase and execution phase. In this phase, most of the lean startup stuff happens. We find all our answers. We have the customer discovery. We have the customer validation. From this, we get some feedback. We make our changes, we make our credits. And when we are out of this phase, then we can move to a customer creation and company building phase. I'll go over these later, but this is an overview for you to know. So when we get to it, you have an idea how it works. For our search, there is this great tool called the Business Model Canvas. This is the tool that we use in our search phase to find out our answers, test our assumptions. This tool is replacing business plans because it's just one page. It has everything in it. It's very easy to communicate. It's very easy to understand. If changes happen, you just change something and send them that one pager instead of thick documents of 40 or I don't know, 100 pages that people have to look into for changes. So it's just one page and everybody just can quickly get up to date with it. It is used to organize our thinking and uh, getting out of the building, testing our hypotheses, testing our questions, and come back on a free canvas with what we have learned and go from there. By the end of it, we end up with a business model that works. Right, so that's the, the process of the search phase then, not the execution phase. Correct. Okay. A startup is a temporary organization to find the answers. When we have the answers, we're not a startup anymore. It's designed to search for a repeatable and a scalable business model. Therefore, our tool is called Business Model Canvas, and the book is Business Model Generation. As you can see, it's a simple poster with a bunch of boxes in it. We stand in front of it with a bunch of uh, post-it notes in our hat, and put them on there, discuss among, among the team, get our answers, um, go out, do our tests, and come back. Now I'm going to go over each box and tell you um, what's happening in each box and what's the thinking behind it and how do we go about this. First one is the middle one right there. It's called the value of proposition. It is about describing what is the problem that we're solving. What are we building? Is this a web app? Is this a mobile app? Is this a company? Is this a feature of a product? Is this a product? What is it that we're building? And what problem are we solving with that? And for whom? Who's the customer? That information goes in that middle box for the value proposition. Customer segment is where we discuss in detail who our customer is and uh, um, everything about them. Who they are, why would they buy, why would, why would they pay for this, and what's their persona. And when I say persona, it's a, like a one or two page document that you explain everything about your client. You even give them a name, Jack or Mary or whatever. You discuss and explain how old Jack is, and what's his marital status, what's, what, what does he do for a living, what kind of a salary he has, and and on and on and on, everything. So when I see him in the street, I can say, oh, her, his client, oh, her client, as detailed as possible, because everything that you do, you're gonna think about that guy in your head. You're gonna think about that woman in your head. Would Mary like this? Not? I go from there. And uh, in defining our personas, basically who our client is, sometimes, we want to oversimplify things, but pay attention to maybe you have more than one persona or more client for a business, especially on the part that it's um, not, the, the payment is not directly made by the user. I'm gonna use Google as an example. Who do you think um, Google services is for? Who target audience for Google? Everybody. Everybody for their search service. And how much is that? Free. It's free. Everybody, free 
is one business model for Google. But they don't have only one business model. They also have the AdWords section. Who's the client for that? And how much is that? Not free. Right here, we have two business models. Therefore, we're going to need two personas. We're going to need two canvases for different parts of the business, maybe the same company, but there are different services, different avatars, different um, cost structures. So that has to be clear in our mind who are our clients and for which one and develop and build our business based on the personas that we're gonna um, have. Next box, channels. Channels is basically about how our product is going to get to our clients. There's raw material, some process that we do in our company, then we deliver it to our clients. If it's a web app, information is out there, they send their robots out there, they get the information, they put it in the database, it's available to the search box, we create an interface for people, they go in, delivery via web, they put the box, search term in the box, they hit the submit, the answer appears on the page. This is a channel called web. Think about a channel when it comes to a mobile app. Think of your channel when it comes to FedEx delivery. So how our service is going to be delivered to our clients is the conversation of that box called channels. Customer relationships. Three important questions. How do I get customers? How do I keep my customers? How do I get even more customers? Or sell more to the same clients? Maybe they started with a package that is $5 a month. How can I upgrade them to the $50 a month? So customer relationship box is the box that talks about questions like that. Lead generation and lead conversion and client fulfillment. And obviously all of that, which is the part that deals with our client side of the equation, has money attached to it. And that's the next box, which is the revenue stream. Who's paying for this? How they're paying for this? How much are they paying for this? Or if you have different services, again, different uh, canvases. And uh, what's our strategy to capture that payment? Is it credit card? Is it online? Is it check? Is it in person? Is it via app? How? All of that is explained over there and calculations are made. They also have an iPad app for the um, business canvas. Now on the company side, next box is key resources. In that box, we explain what are the most important assets for a business model? The stuff that we need to get um, our work done. Is it money, finances? Is it the physical location? Is it vans? Do we need storefronts? What intellectual property do we need to buy, develop? Um, how many people do we need? What kind of skills do we need? All of the resources that we need to be able to Deliver, deliver our services to our clients. And obviously, um, we're going to have partners. Who are these partners? Next box, key partners. Who are these partners? And what is it that they're doing for us? Partners or suppliers. When actually do we need them? Do we need them from day one? Or does it come a bit later? Can I go without the suppliers from day one or not? So what are the key resources that they're giving me and what are the key activities that they are taking care of for, for our business? Next box, key activities. Basically, what are the most important things the company must do to make the business model work? Is it production? Is it problem solving? What are the main activities? What's the main thing that the customer is buying for us, from us? And obviously, the cost structure, last box, on our business canvas. What's the cost of operating our business with everything that we have to do? 
dealing with key resources, key activities, and key partners to be able to deliver this value to our customer through this channel, and that's how we're going to interact with them and make our revenue over here. Any question? Make sense? We're good? So that's our tool. One of the tools. It's called Business Model Canvas. There is another version of it called the Lean Canvas. It's a little bit different, so I'm not going to explain that, but if you're interested, you can look it up. But as you can see, it has the basic, same basic structure. And we go through our Lean Startup Cycle using that tool. And this is how it's done. You remember this. We are in the search phase, customer discovery, then customer validation, making credits. And when we are done with this part, then we can move to this part in customer creation and company building. So how is that done? In customer discovery, we're going to ask people the simple questions. Do you have this problem? It's an easy to assume that they have that problem. But is that really a problem? And how severe that problem is, because many times people have a problem, but they don't really want to do anything about it. It doesn't bother them that much. Or they're OK with a free service to solve it, but eh, they don't really want to pay for it. So how then our approach is going to be different for any of this. So we have some assumption. We go out to the market. It's called get out of the building. Answers are not in your office. Get out of the building, go out, go talk to your clients, get answers, come back. When I mentioned I was in my startup mode for two years, that's what I did. I went to conferences in different cities that I was really not interested in the subject of the talk, but the room was 400 people of my clients. That's what I wanted to be, to get to know them, to talk to them, to see what is it that makes them happy, what makes them sad. Uh, what's interesting to them? What's the language that they use? Ask them questions. Would you do, do you have this problem? Do you also suffer from this? Do you really want to do something about it? How much do, are you willing to pay for it? Um, an example of a valuable piece of information that I found was uh, my company, Kazoom, is about um, implementing the technology side of a business, an online business. So obviously they have to deal with the CRM, they have to deal with the website, they have with the social media, what about the content, so all of these different things. My, and my first uh, assumption was, well, I make a bunch of products, module, 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 they buy each one, and uh, they go about it. My assumption was, growing your business online is really hard, because there is this huge universe of online marketing and how to grow your business. There are so many books and courses and resources and people are spending thousands of dollars on all this stuff to learn what to do to grow their business. And because it's an online business, you're dealing with tools. And we have this huge universe of tools. I'm guessing each one of you has to deal with at least 20. And if you really want to run a business, it's about 50 that you find out about them in the first week, quickly gets overwhelming. Many of them, you open it up, and there are so many features and so many different menus and sub-menus that quickly overwhelming. Who's going to do all of that? And the small business owner, their job is to sell olive oil or coaching services. They're not, neither a marketer or a technologist to go through all of that. So they have to deal with people, hire designers, hire programmers, hire, 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 and now they have to manage all of these people. So in my first assumption that I'm going to give him a bunch of different solutions, I thought I'm solving their problem. And they were kind of saying yes, but it's not, it wasn't on the firm yes. Didn't know what the problem is. I kept talking and kept asking them questions. And I realized there is the same pattern going on. By giving them all of these little small solutions so they can do it themselves, I am not really solving anything because their problem is overwhelmed. I'm adding more stuff for them now to manage. So I thought, well, how about this? Instead of done for you, I make it a do it done for you. 
uh, instead of doing do it yourself, I make the done for you solution. And instead of having so many different little solutions, I make one big one, and I say, you want to get your business online? Everything you need is done here in one product, one purchase. Obviously, all of these little payments now became a much bigger um, ticket item for them to, to pay by thousands of dollars. But suddenly, there was that spark in their eye. Ah, yes, that's what I want. If you can do that, that's fantastic. So in, in digging even deeper, I thought, how about this? You don't even have to deal with the designers I'm gonna to bring to the team or programmers. I'm gonna give you one account manager, or you only have to talk to one person about everything, and that person is going to take care of everything for you. That's your market manager. That's not an idea that I have. It's brilliant because everybody says yes to it, but it's not my idea. It was found through this process of talking to clients and, and trying to sell them the products that I had or sign up beta user clients and all of that. So that's what happened in the customer discovery and customer validation program. That was an example of the kind of a conversation you're gonna have with your client. Is there a match between problem and solution? I just gave you the example. Do you have this problem? Yes. I can solve it like this. Eh. There is no match. Do you have this problem? Yes. Are you willing to pay for it? Yes. How about this solution? Yes, I like that. And there you have a match between your solution and your customer or the problem. So it doesn't matter how many times you have to go through this pivot for the solution, for the um, amount of features, for the speed of delivery, for the price, for the payment system, there are so many different levels. You go through this until you have all of the answers that you need. And that's the pivot. Exactly. Repeat until proven all of your assumptions. And there's a big list of them. And that will, after you have all of the answers, actually, let me go to the back one. I'm going to just read this because this is important. The pivot. That's what all the successful businesses have in common, whether they call it pivot or not, whether lean startup was invented yet or not. Um, many companies started with this idea, they ended up with something else, for whatever reason. American Express, even though it's a financial company, it wasn't like that before. They started as a package delivery company, much like FedEx or uh, what's the other one? UPS. And they were, you know, moving packages around. Then the laws changed in the United States that package handling is only legal if it's done by US Postal Service. So they were going out of business. They couldn't do their business anymore. They looked at their business and they noticed there is this small part of their business which is people using their service to send money to each other that is still can work. The rules doesn't apply to it. So they just focus on that. There is, and throughout everything else, that's a big pivot of what you do. Now you have another service, another product, another set of customers, and just do that. They kept doing it. They became a big financial company. Even after the laws changed again, now, private companies can uh, send parcels around. They don't even want to go back. They remain a financial services company. They did not have that plan when they started, but they were able to make a pivot. They were able to adjust, adapt, make a change, make educated guess. And that's basically the root cause to their success or anybody else's. The ideas great entrepreneurs had are just as outlandish as the ones that had, um, as the ones had by the failed entrepreneurs. It's just how to go about it that can make it work or not. It's about keeping your eye on on the direction that you're going, but not being so stubborn and do not persevere basically to failure.
And after that, when we have our answer, we have a product that people like it and is actually solving the problem and they're willing to pay for it, we do what is called customer creation, creating end user on demand, which is basically the marketing part of it. Marketing your product, marketing your business, branding, and all of that. And uh, there is also this concept of lean marketing. <laughs> and building a company, which is an organization that can do what you created here, what you found here, in a scalable way, so the company can grow, which is the basic goal of a company, to grow. This is another tool. It's called the validation board. It, it is a very good tool to use when you want to do your tests, the getting out of the building part of it. The iterations happen here. So we designed the whole business model with the business canvas, and we have assumptions in different boxes for different things, and now we have to test them to see if our assumptions are correct or not. And this is a tool to, to use. Let me big, bring a bigger version of it so I can quickly go through this with you. I'm not going to go into details. You start with your hypothesis over there that you want to test, and uh, that's who we are going to serve for the problem that we are going to solve, and that has a bunch of assumptions. Let's say I want to create this. I assume people want to point at things, and I think something that they can hold in their hand and point at things and put the light over there is a solution that they want. That's my, one of my assumptions. Actually, that's two assumptions. Assumption number one, people want to point at something. Do they? Really? Maybe not. Assumption number two, they're looking for a solution. Assumption number three, they're actively looking for a solution. Assumption number four, they're willing to pay for a solution. Assumption number five, a device that they can carry with them itself is the one that they want. So as you can see, there are many, many assumptions. You can go as detailed as possible. You, in fact, you have to go as detailed as possible. And you put them all in here in a bunch of uh, post-it notes. Then looking at those assumptions, you can find one of them that is the most critical assumption. Basically, if that assumption is wrong, we don't have a business. Our most basic assumption is people have a need to point at things. If you find out that you don't have this need, and nothing else matters. So we take that assumption, we put it here in this yellow box called riskiest assumption. Now that's what we want to test, that people do have this problem. So how are we going to test it? The way that we're going to test is one of the three methods of pitch, concierge, or exploration. Exploration is basically questions. Do you have this problem? Do you want it solved? Do you want it solved fast? That's the exploration phase for the assumption. If our assumption is at the level that we do have a solution or we think we have a solution, we want to see if the people want this solution, they're actively looking for it, is the pitch part that, well, we know you have this solution. Would you be interested if I had a solution for you? Would you be interested if I solved your problem so with you know, so-and-so product or so-and-so way? And that's called the pitch. And the way that you find out if a pitch is successful or not is to make a commitment to a payment. Could be a down payment, but they have to act. And the next method is called concierge, is basically that before creating the solution, we're just gonna fake it and say we, we have it now and basically do all the work manual. For example, if it's a website that you can go online and register for so-and-so and get these responses back, instead of developing all of the programming and all the database and all of that back end, just create the interface where people can just submit the form. You have people over here actually with hand doing the work to see if this is what they want. If this is the, how they like to interact before programming all of the features in it, discover them all first, then go about it. And in that process, you need to decide on what's your minimum success criteria. Let's say the first assumption was people have this problem. 
Before going out there, before going out there and asking people, do you have this problem or not, we're going to decide. If 60% of people say yes, then it's validated. If less than 50% say no, it's not validated. So we have to change our assumptions. So we decide what we would consider success before going out there. Or if 20% of the people that they said they have a problem, they're inter in interested in the solution, they actually reach their wallet, then we consider that a success. So you decide on what's going to be successful before going out there, and you either end up with the validated or invalidated assumption. If it's validated, good, goes to this box. Invalidated, it goes over there. We either make changes to that assumption, and we test it again until we find our answer. So that's the tool that can be used for going through the iteration cycles. The point of it is to get out of the building. That includes Twitter, that includes making cold calls, that includes actually walking to people on the street, and actually traveling to the location. Get out of the building, have actual one-on-one -on -one conversation with your people, avoid surveys, avoid mass tools. Yeah, you're gonna get some information, but not as good as quality of, of the one-on-one -on -one interactions. You design experiments, you run tests, you get your data, you repeat. You go over it, over and over, over and over, until you have all of the answers. At the end, it is all about a search for a business model that works. And when you have that for your business, for the nonprofit, for a feature, for a product, for a new service, for whatever, then we are in the black. These are some resources. Obviously, everything on LeanStartup.com, but specifically, this is a good place to start. The principles. Steve Blank also has a great website and blog. A plethora of resources on that website. Uh, one of them is called, for example, uh, uh, Startup Tools for everything that you want to do, like the question that you asked at the beginning. Or like 20, 30 different options with links and explanations and discussions and all of that. Um, the books, Steve Blank's The Startup Owner Manual, The Bible, Eric Reese's Lean Startup, Business Model Generation that goes uh, over the conversation of the Lean Startup Canvas. That's the whole book about that. Um, Running Lean, again, explains everything actually when it comes to the language of the book and understanding the whole concept. I like this one better than the Lean Startup. You need to read both, but that also gives you a lot of practical examples and things that you can do. And uh, um, Lean Analytics, which is the latest one among all of them. It's new, um, self-explanatory. It's the way to go about measuring your data and analyzing it and uh, uh, find out if your assumptions are valid or invalid. That's probably my, yep, that's my last slide. I have my contact information up there. And that's the presentation tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions?